Hey guys, it's Chili here. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 20. Today's topic is the projective matrix transformation. And this is a topic that I feel like a lot of people new to 3D graphics, they, uh, they, they learn it, but they don't really understand it. They're just mostly doing copy and paste. They have a general idea of how it works, but they don't have a real thorough understanding of the mechanics or the derivation of the matrices that are used. And what I what my goal is for today is to give you guys a little bit more of a concrete understanding, remove some of the vagueness, remove some of the uncertainty. But before we jump into the matrix, I want to do a quick review of perspective projection. We covered it in tutorial four as a very important concept, and I introduced it by giving you guys the model of the pinhole camera, which basically allows us to constrain the light coming off of a point in 3D space to just a single ray. Only a single ray with a single tra trajectory will be coming in from any one point in 3D space. And that will map nicely to points on a 2D space, our uh, projection screen. Now, annoying side effect of this uh, pinhole camera using this aperture is that images that are projected onto our screen are going to be flipped. So, for example, here, this point appears in the right-hand side uh, respect relative to the aperture, but is going to be projected on the left-hand side of the screen. But we can fix this quite easily. All we do is we move our projection screen in front of the aperture. Now, physically, thinking of this in terms of, you know, physics, uh, it doesn't make much sense in the real world. It's not really possible. You need the light to first go through the aperture to get focused through here before it can be projected. But in terms of the mathematics, it doesn't really matter whether you put it behind or in front. So putting it in front means that a point on the left-hand side will project onto the left-hand side of the projection surface, which is nice and clean. Now the next logical step is that we want to actually calculate the coordinates of a point on the projective surface given the coordinates of a point in our world space. And this can be figured out quite intuitively from using just similar triangles. So if we've got our projective surface and it is a um, distance of one unit away from the focus point and then we've got a point in space that is two away from the focus point. This point's x here, when it's projected, is going to be divided by 2, which is the same as the distance from the focus point. So you just divide by the distance from the focus point, which is z. And there is how we derived our perspective divide. It's just divide by z for x and y. Now, for our surface of projection, we basically uh, defined that negative 1 would represent the, uh, in the x, that would represent the left-hand extent of the screen, positive one would represent the right hand. And we defined a mapping that would map these coordinates to actual pixel coordinates in our, uh, in our screen buffer. Now what this gives us is this gives us a cone of vision that's going to look something like this. We can draw a straight line from the focal point to the edges of our projected screen. And now we can say that any point in the world inside of this, uh, inside of this cone here is going to be appearing on the screen, and any point outside is going to be appearing off the screen, right? Because it won't project onto this screen here. So we know this distance is 1, and this distance is 1. So this is going to be 45 degrees. So our cone of vision here is 90 degrees, and this is our field of view. This is probably familiar to anyone who's played 3D games before. Field of view is a common setting option that you have for the graphics of a game. And it controls how much is going, the, the width of this field here that is going to be projected onto the screen that you see. Now let's say we want to make our field of view larger. How could we do that? Well, there's a couple things we could do. Uh, we could make our projection screen larger. If we make that larger, and then we can draw from the focal point to the edges of the screen, you'll see, yeah, we get a larger field of view. That makes sense, right? Uh, another thing you could do is you could keep the projection screen the same size, but move it closer to the focal point. And again, if you do that, it's pretty uh, intuitive to see that you're going to get a larger field of view. So by controlling these things, you can control the field of view. Another limitation of our current system is it's, uh, it's fixed to an aspect ratio of a 
perfect square, which is not usually what you want for your images. I mean, back in the day, it was more common to have, you know, 4, 3, and now it's 16 by 9. So this fixed aspect ratio of a square, not so great. We like to control that. We like to control our field of view. How do? Well, let's look at that cone of vision, the things that we can see, uh, and look at it in three-dimensional space for a second. It's going to look something like this. It's going to be less of a cone, more of a pyramid extending to infinity. Now, let's restrict uh, not just the X and the Y. Let's also restrict the Z. So we're going to say, okay, so you're not going to be able to see, you're not going to draw anything that's closer than the uh, stuff in this plane here. And we're also not going to draw anything that's further uh, beyond this plane here. So we can call this the near and these the far planes. So this shape that we define here with the near and the far planes is called a frustum. And it is inside this shape that all the points that will be rendered on the screen lie within. Now after the perspective divide, uh, what we get is a space that looks like this. Uh, so all the points where the x is between negative 1 and positive 1 and the y is between negative 1 and positive 1 and the z is, well we'll talk about that later, but the z is also between a certain range, those points will all be rendered on the screen. For our purposes, the points that will be rendered to the z is going to be from uh, 0 to 1. So this is a half cube and this is what you get from all the points inside this frustum after you've done the perspective division. Now our current system is lacking in a few departments. First of all, the view cone, or I guess the view pyramid, is a, you know, it's a perfect square. Which we don't really like. We want to control this aspect ratio here, but we can't control it as of right now. So that's the first problem. The other thing that our system doesn't do is it doesn't map Z values to be between with, within some range. There is no near plane and no far plane. Z is just whatever Z is in the world. It's not being remapped. And again, like I said, we want to be able to control this frustum, this frustum that maps points from world space into this space here. We want to control it to do things like, you know, adjust the aspect ratio, adjust the field of view, and just generally adjust, you know, the, the logical scale of this projective surface in the world. Now, before I get on to how we're going to control this frustum here, let me talk a little bit more about this cube. This is what we're going to map the frustum to. It's called, uh, we call this NDC space. It stands for Normalized Device Coordinates. Now what we mean by device coordinates is that these coordinates here specify uh, positions on the device that don't depend on the, uh, on the screen metrics, on the uh, resolution in pixels of the screen. So for these guys, you know, for example for the X, negative 1 is always the left hand side of the screen, positive 1 is always the far right of the screen and zero is going to be the middle of the screen, and the same for Y. And that's very nice. Now, why normalized? Well, well, we'll get to that in a second. But this is similar to what we've been doing so far. I called it pube space. And the reason why I called it pube space was because NDC, it, uh, it puts X and Y between 1 and negative 1, but it also maps Z. Uh, and for, you know, direct 3D, it generally maps it from zero to positive 1. So that's why I gave the space that we were working in up until now a different name. And why did I choose the name Pubes? Because, you know, it's, it's me. It's Chili. You know he's going to choose a name like Pubes. And one last thing, the, uh, the distance to the projective uh, surface and the distance to the near plane are usually going to be the same. So they don't have to be the same. There's nothing saying they have to be the same, but it's pretty much always the same. That's what we're going with here. So the near plane uh, also represents the projective surface. Alright, now let's get to the fun part, actually deriving the matrix. So, the first thing you're probably going to think is, well, at the heart, the projective, the perspective transform is going to be dividing by Z. And, uh, well, matrix multiplication, you multiply, you know, your vectors, your vector values by some values in the matrix, add together. It's a sum of products. How do you get a division out of this? The answer is it's impossible. So, what the hell? Well, there's a bunch of bullshit that has been dreamed up in order to back rationalize using multiplication, matrix multiplication for a division. 
and it's it's a bunch of bullshit but uh you know whatever whatever lets the mathematicians sleep at night that's what i say so how does it work well you know that this w boy is always generally going to be a one except in special cases where you've got like a, a normal in which case it, it becomes a zero to indicate that it's for just pure directionality the reason why it's a one usually is because that one activates the values in these rows that are used for the translation. All right. But here's the thing. If you have a vector and w is not w not equal to 1, this we we say that this vector is no longer in normal real space. It has now transcended to a new dimension. It is in projective space. Uh, or when we say it is a homogeneous coordinate okay great what does that mean that means that if you want to work with this vector you want to do stuff with it in the real world you first have to normalize it you have to take it out of the homogeneous coordinate projective space and bring it back into the real world and how you do that well again if it's not one you divide by w W divided by W is 1. So you divide the whole vector by W. This is normalizing the vector. And now you're going to have X over W, Y over W, Z over W. And you're going to have 1 in the W space. And now it's back in normal space. Everyone's happy. We can use the vector to do stuff again. But why do we care about this bullshit convention? Well, if we follow this convention if we make our system so that it will normalize whenever w is not equal to one then we can create a matrix that sets the output w to something that we want to divide by say let's say we we make it set w to be equal to the value of z in the output then when we have to normalize the homogeneous matrix it is going to divide by z and therefore we can make our system use a matrix multiplication to somehow magic in a division. So yeah, it seems like a bunch of hanky-panky justification, uh, but here we have a matrix multiplication that wink wink performs a perspective division. Or at least uh, we have the beginnings of one. We have a glimmer of hope. And the form of the vector that gets the job done looks like this. We don't really care right now what's in these other spots. But here, in the, uh, in the fourth column, we have a 1 in this position, which is going to select the Z. And then we have a 0 in this position, which is going to cancel out this 1. So the end result is that W is going to become Z. The value of Z is going to be captured and stored in the W position of the output vector. And later on, the other components are going to be divided by that when the normalization happens. There you go. There's part one. So now we got the division taken care of. We want to take care of the mapping. So we want to do things like we want to map this, uh, this plane here, or this trapezoid, I guess, in world space to this rectangle in NDC space. You know, after the perspective divide is uh, performed. So after the, the multiplication of the transformation matrix and then the normalization happens, this should be mapped to this. And we've got to figure out the coefficients that go into the matrix that make this mapping possible. So let's look at what are the parameters that control the mapping for X, let's say. Uh, so if you've got a point that's right on the edge of the screen, that means this one is going to map to negative 1 after the, uh, after the projection is performed. Now we can see right away that if we move the screen meaning the near plane, that's the same as the near plane. If we move that closer, this is what our uh, field is going to look like. And so this point that before mapped to negative 1 is now probably going to map to negative uh, 0 0.5 because this here is now mapping to negative 1. So this one has now become negative 0 0.5. So controlling the near plane, moving the near plane, will change the mapping of x. And likewise, if we make the projective surface larger, that is also going to make this x-coordinate smaller. So, this dimension here is the width of the projective surface divided by 2. So that's w over 2. We can see that a larger w over 2 
gives you a smaller x. That's proportional. So you double the size of w over 2, and your mapping is going to get twice as small. Whereas if you bring the near plane closer, if you cut this distance in half, you're also going to cut your mapping in half. So n is directly proportional to the mapping, and w over 2 is inversely proportional to the mapping. In other words, this is division, this is multiplication. So we get x times n divided by w over 2 maps to x prime, and this here can be simplified just to 2n divided by w. So x times this, and this is going to be what you get in your matrix multiplication. So x prime should be x times 2n over w. So this one's 0, 0, 0, because y, z, and there's no additive constant here. And the same story, as you can imagine, it's exactly the same for y. It's just instead of w, you've got h, and the position is a little different. It's going to be 2n over h. Now you've got your mappings for x and y. Now the z is a little trickier. What we want to do is, well, we've got a near plane, and then we've got a far plane. And we want to map the values on here to 0, and the values on here to 1. Now mapping these guys to 0 is pretty easy. All we got to do is subtract the near plane from the z value. If we do that, then all the points on the near plane will map to 0. And we can do that pretty easily if we set this to negative n, then 1, if we set this, let's say, to 1, then it'll be z times 1 minus n. Z minus n, there you go, you've got your translation. But we also want to map points on this far plane to 1. So let's say the far plane is, uh, I don't know, 10. So that means that we've basically got to subtract 1 and then divide by the length, the distance between the near plane and the far plane. And that'll squeeze this range of 9 into a range of, you know, 0 to 1. And the best way to set this up is with a system of equations. So we're going to erase this. We're going to say this is A, this is B. Okay. So, AZ plus 1 times B is equal to what? Well, uh, so when Z is on the near plane, then we want, the, well, we want it to map to 0. But when Z is on the far plane, we want it to map to 1. So how do we do that? Well, a times a near plus b is equal to 0. And a times the far plus b is equal to the far. Now you might be saying, Chili, I think you made a mistake here. Don't you mean a times the far plus b is equal to 1? Because when z is on the far plane, we want it to map to 1. Yes. But, we want it to map the 1 after the, uh, the normalization, after the division by z. So when z is at the far plane, then you're going to divide by f, and that will be 1. But our matrix has to take into account before the division, so it has to take into account that division by z is going to happen afterwards, and that's why we set it up AF plus B is equal to F. We can handle this a bunch of ways. The easiest way is to subtract one equation from another. So if I subtract this equation from this one, I'm going to get AN minus AF is equal to 0 minus F, which is negative F. And that means if we factor out the A, A is equal to negative F divided by N minus F, which is equal to F over f minus n. So a is equal to f over f minus n. Put that in our matrix. Now what is b equal to? Well, if we look at this equation here, b is equal to negative a n, which is equal to negative n f over f minus n. And there you go. There is your freaking equation. You apply this matrix to a vector and then you normalize, it is going to map z that's on the near plane to 0, and it's going to map z that's on the far plane to 1. 
So for example, if I set up here, this point here, the Z would map to zero. This point here, the Z would map to one. Now, interesting, if you go halfway between, so you've got a value whose original Z was equal to 5.5, this, you might expect it to map to 0.5 because it's halfway between the near and the far, but this mapping isn't linear, so it actually maps to 0.9 something. Uh, so you've got to be, you got to understand that because of the division there, this mapping is not a linear mapping. We're only guaranteed that the near plane is going to map to 0, the far plane is going to map to 1, and any points in between are going to map the values between 0 and 1. But yeah, this is the canonical perspective transform projection matrix that uh, Direct3D actually uses and shows you in its documentation. Uh, and I, I heartily recommend you guys trying some uh, matrix multiplications out by yourself by hand just to verify that this works. So you can try out values like, let's say, choose for x, choose w over 2, and just put zeros in the other places, multiply it out, see what you get. See if you get what you expect to get. You can assume n is equal to 1. And, you know, also try out things like 0, 0, uh, f, and 0, 0, n, 1. Plug those in, see if you can get the results out. Plugging in these different uh, input vectors and actually doing the math yourself is going to give you a little better idea of how this matrix works. All right, I've had just about enough math bullshit for today. How about you? Let's get into the code. So we're going to introduce the projection matrix. So in mate, I, uh, I did a few things. Not very important. I made all these uh, factory functions, const expert. Uh, but besides that, not too much interesting going on except for here where we added a new matrix. So after translation, we added projection. And as you can see, it's just what we derived. It takes the width and the height of the projected surface and the distance to the near and the far plane, and it will give us a projection matrix. Great. Now, obviously, a bunch of changes are going to have to take place in order to facilitate this new, uh, new system. So I renamed the pube screen transformer to the NDC screen transformer because now it is actually working in true normalized device coordinates. Uh, and what it's going to do, well, it's going to be doing less than before, about the same. Instead of dividing by Z, it is going to be dividing by W. And it is going to store the inverse of W into W itself for the perspective correct uh, interpolation. But other than that, it's actually pretty much just the same bullshit. So now in the pipeline, we're going to be using the NDC screen transformer instead of the pube screen transformer. Uh, down here, again, same change. Now, besides that, uh, what we're doing here is instead of interpolating, or instead of uh, recovering Z, we don't need to do that anymore. We can just use Z directly in the test. And it's not going to be the true Z. It's going to be the Z that's been mapped between 0 to 1. But remember, I showed you that mapping was nonlinear. So we can actually interpolate that correctly and still get a Z value that is useful for our depth comparison. So we no longer need to recover Z. We can just use Z directly now. And then if we pass the test, then we recover W from, you know, the inverse of W, and we multiply that against all the attributes in order to recover them before we do the uh, pixel shader. Now, the file that has undergone probably the most radical change is going to be the specular fong point effect. And uh, first of all, the output here, uh, the constructors are going to take vec4s for the position because now the position is going to have a uh, W that is not equal to 1. So we're going to need to input that as a vec4 and save that W. Uh, so that changed here. I, I realized one thing, and that was that normal does not actually have to be a vec4. It can remain a vec3 and still do its job perfectly, because nor n doesn't have to be, you know, normalized, doesn't need any sort of per perspective or projection transform applied to it. So we keep that as a vec3. Uh, now, we're going to have to do a little um, 
more particular managing of our transformation matrices. We have to keep the world matrix separate from the projection matrix. So we have two separate functions here, bind world and bind projection. And the reason for that is that you cannot apply your projection to your normal. If you do that, you're going to mess your normal up because the projection includes a whole bunch of different, you know, stretches and scaling stuff, and that is going to mess with your normal. So we want to multiply our normal and our uh, VEC3 for the world position just by the world transform. We don't want to project those. And we want to apply the concatenation of the world and the projection only to the position vector. So here, whenever we bind a world or a projection, we store that in the world and projection. And then we also uh, concatenate the world and projection together and store that in world proj. And then here, we multiply input point uh, by world proj. That's our position. And then our normal and our world position, just multiply that by the world. We start these all these guys all off with mate for identity. And that's really the only difference. The geometry shader just passes through. Pixel shader does exactly what it was doing before. In the specular fong point scene, now we are going to be, instead of binding transformation, we're going to separately bind world and bind projection. And also for the solid effect, for rendering the indicator for the light source, we want to bind world and then bind projection separately. And yeah, so we had to obviously modify, modify solid effect so that it had a separate, uh, its own output vector that used vec4 position. And then the same code in here, bind world, bind projection. Other minor changes is while I was debugging this code, I needed a simple triangle, so I added this model. It's the test triangle model. In zbuffer, I added a function that returns the minimum and the maximum value in the zbuffer. Again, not very useful. And then in game.cpp, commented out all of these effects because they're not, they're all, they don't work anymore, right? They don't work with the new pipeline. Uh, added test triangle in there. And then in here, yeah, added test triangle, commented out all these guys because, again, they don't work. And then just a small little commit here. I reorganized some stuff here. I renamed specular phone point scene to fong point scene. Finally fixed that and some other stuff. Let me just change to this branch. So you can see for the shaders and the scenes, now all the defunct shaders, I put them in their own little filter folder there. So they don't, they're, not, they're not stinking up the joint. But yeah, if we run this, so here's the test triangle, and it, uh, it seems to work fairly well. But let's switch to our good old friend. Oh my God, what have they done to you? You are a mess. So, it looks like our back face culling isn't working very well. Why could this be? Well, if we go into the pipeline and we go into the stage where we do the back face culling here, we see that uh, we're taking the, the cross product on the triangle to get the normal, and then we're doing a vector from the view position to a point on that triangle, which is just going, since the view position is zero, zero, that's gonna be here. Only the problem is, the points at the assemble triangle stage, they're in homogeneous coordinates. Uh, and they have actually been, well, like the points on the near plane here, for example, they've been translated to zero. So they're no longer, they don't, the same rules don't apply anymore. So what we really have to do is we have to apply the same projective transformation to our viewpoint, which is zero, zero. So we apply the perspective the projective transformation, not the world transformation. We don't want to move the point around in the world. In the world, it's still at zero, zero, but we have to apply the same projective transformation that was applied to the points so that they're in the same space and the, uh, the calculation will match up. So here in this coming here, fix back face culling clip space. So in the pipeline here, what we do is uh, we add a line here that gets the eye position translated by the projection matrix only. So that's why I added that get proj uh, getter in the previous commit it was for this stuff here. And we're going to trans we're going to translate the point 000 and you know 1 for the uh, w coordinate. 
And this part here is basically the same as what we had before, only we have to take that vector from the I position to position on the triangle, because now the I position is not at 0, 0, 0. And if we run with that adjustment, we see again, okay, now everything works like it was working before. No problems. Now the next problem we want to tackle is we want different, uh, different aspect ratios. So we want to increase the width of the, uh, the view frustum in world space. So what we do is for our projection matrix here, instead of doing two and two, which was the width and the height of the frustum in the view space, we're gonna, the width we're gonna go 2.666. So this will give us a, um, an aspect ratio of four to three. Now when we do that, we notice it works. We are now mapping a wider frustum uh, to the same NDC space. But the problem is we're drawing it in the same square viewport. So now everything looks squished in the X because it is squished. Um, so what we want to do now is we want our viewport aspect ratio to match the aspect ratio of our view frustum in the world space. And that's simple enough. We go into graphics.h, we change our uh, screen height to be 480 now instead of 640. So now it's 640 by 480. That is a 4 to 3 aspect ratio that matches the aspect ratio of our frustum. And now everything's looking good again. And we can finally say goodbye to that ugly square window. We now have, well, at least 4 by 3, which is better than square. And, you know, you can make it um, 16, 16 and 9 if you like, but I don't care. This is fine for me. Now, the other thing we like to control is this field of view here. Say we want to keep the aspect ratio the same, but we want to increase the field of view, how many things are going to appear in our viewport. And again, you could increase the field of view uh, by increasing the, uh, the width and the height of the projection surface, and that would give you more. But oftentimes, you don't want to specify your field in view in terms of the width and height. You want to give it an angle, and you want it to calculate the, the width and the height, the matrix, based on that angle. Now the calculation for that is pretty simple. It's just some simple trigonometry. Uh, so I'm not going to go into it here, but the, the, general, uh, the general formula is just 1 over 10 of the field of view divided by 2. And usually we specify field of view in uh, degrees, so I have made my function in degrees, although it pains me greatly to do so. Uh, so here it converts degrees into radians, and then here it gets you the width for the field of view. And then the height is just going to be the width times the aspect ratio. And there you have it. And then in your specular Fong scene, you can specify field of view as 100 degrees, and you want your aspect ratio to be 1.33, which is, you know, 4 to 3. And if you do that, now you got, you know, 100 degree field of view. And if you were to say to crank that up to say like 140, here's 160. All right, it's starting to look weird. If I zoom in, you see things get smaller with a wider field of view because you've got more to fit on the screen, right? So if I zoom this in, now you can see the effect of a field of view like that, sort of. It's, it's shit looks weird, right? You, you want to keep it within a sane range, generally within, well, 60 is pretty low for computers. It's, it's kind of common for consoles though. But you know, you want to keep it between, you know, 60, 70 and maybe on the top range, 120. I don't know. Keep it in that range. Generally, 100, deg 100 degrees is pretty good, I think. It depends on, but it depends on the person. In the game, you probably want to set that as a setting that the user can change for their own preferences. And there you go. There is the projective transform matrix in all its glory. Uh, the one I showed you, that is the one that is the actual canonical one for Direct3D, the, the common basic one. Uh, OpenGL is a little different. Now, the main difference between OpenGL and Direct3D is OpenGL maps its Z between negative 1 and 1, whereas Direct3D maps it from 0 to 1. Uh, so that's going to give you a little change. And of course, Direct uh, OpenGL uses uh, column vectors, whereas Direct3D uses row vectors. But yeah, there's all sorts of mappings that you can use, and they, uh, they have the different applications. Some map from 1 to 0. This is actually recommended by NVIDIA. Um, and, you know, some effects might want you to map from 0 
to infinity in the Z. It's all stuff, but the zero to one here is the basic one, and it's probably the one we're going to be using when I do hardware 3D as well. One cool thing to note is that you're not limited to using a perspective projection with this system. You can just change the matrix that you concatenate, and you can use uh, you can turn the system into an orthogonal one. So with perspective, you capture Z in the W coordinate. But with orthogonal, you're not going to do the Z divide, so you just keep W as 1. You don't capture Z. And uh, this part changes a little bit too, but uh, in doing so, yeah, you get an orthogonal projection just by changing your matrix a little bit. No need to rework the pipeline or anything. But that's going to about do it for today. In the next video, we're finally going to implement clipping for a rasterizer because, you know, up until this point, if any part of the model goes outside of the screen, especially the top or the bottom, the damn thing just crashes, and that's probably not pretty good. So we're going to clip that stuff, it's going to enable us to have stuff that's off screen, and that is going to enable in the future us to have a camera that moves around in a world. But until then, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed the video, if you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot, and I will see you soon with some more 3D Fundamentals.